Thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Audible, the best place to listen for whatever you're interested in. I absolutely love Audible and use it every single day. I've been thinking about nuclear weapons a lot lately, which you've probably noticed if you're a fan of the channel, so I recently listened to The Making of the Atomic Bomb by Richard Rhodes, and I loved this deep dive into the history of the Manhattan Project and the first atomic weapons. But no matter what you're interested in, Audible has something for you in their incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre, from mysteries and thrillers to romance and comedy. And Audible is more than just audiobooks. They've also got stories told by the biggest stars like Kerry Washington and Kevin Hart, popular podcasts, and much more. And it's all in one place, so you'll be able to find exactly what you love or something totally new. As an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog that includes the latest bestsellers and new releases, as well as full access to download or stream as much as you want from a growing selection of included audiobooks, Audible originals, and podcasts. Audible is the home of storytelling, with all your audio entertainment in one app. So, what what are you waiting for? Let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash infographics or text infographics to 500-500. The settlers step onto the shores of the strange new land of Poyais. They had been promised by the prince of this newly formed country that it would be a modern European settlement, with a bustling harbor in a resource-rich region of the Americas. Instead, they find a dense jungle inhabited by millions of insects trying to eat them alive. They've been betrayed by a man they had put so much faith in and gave all their money to. A man who claimed to be royalty is nothing more than a con artist named Gregor McGregor, and now the trust they put into him will lead to their deaths. This is the story of tragedy and deceit started a long time ago before the settlers arrived on the shores of what's now Belize. Before Gregor McGregor invented his own country and became a con man, he lived a very different life. Yet this life was not what you might think. In 1786, Gregor McGregor was born into the lower classes of Scottish society. When he was old enough, he joined the British Army, where he was deployed to the Americas in the early 1800s. He fought as a mercenary for hire in the Venezuelan War of Independence from Spain, where he made some important connections. Gregor McGregor was not a great soldier. He wasn't even a good soldier. As cannons bombarded the coastline and soldiers slaughtered one another in the Venezuelan jungles, McGregor made sure to stay away from the front lines and out of harm's way. But what he lacked in military capability, he made up for in cunningness. He used his ability to persuade people that he was important enough to lead instead of fight. This eventually put him in an interesting position that allowed him to bolster his reputation and give himself credibility in the future. During the Venezuelan War for Independence, McGregor gained favor with the already legendary Simón Bolívar, who would one day become known as El Libertador, or the Liberator of America. Bolívar led the countries of Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Panama, and Bolivia in their fight for independence against the Spanish Empire. He was respected by many in the Americas and anyone who wanted to see the Spanish Empire lose its power. This included the British, the French, and the Portuguese. Gregor McGregor did not do much to aid in the fight for freedom in these countries, but he did manage to become very close to Simón Bolívar. So close, in fact, that he eventually married into the family. McGregor wed Bolívar's cousin, which allowed him to become even more closely associated with the great general. He eventually went on to lead his own independent military campaigns in the Caribbean, some of which were mildly successful. In 1817, McGregor recruited a small group of pirates and mercenaries to attack Amelia Island off the coast of Florida. The region was controlled by the Spanish, who at that point in time were slowly losing control of their vast American empire. Even still, this was a bold move as the Spanish had a formidable amount of ships and soldiers in the area and could wipe out McGregor's entire force if they ever caught him. However, do more to luck than anything else, McGregor was able to not only attack the Spanish settlement but capture the island for a brief period of time. Unfortunately, like with many of the battles he took part in, once things started to turn for the worse and it looked like defeat was imminent, McGregor abandoned his men to save himself. The Spanish were coming, so McGregor ordered his ships to retreat, leaving some of his men behind. Those who were unlucky enough to be stranded on Amelia were likely captured, tortured, or killed by the Spanish. Even though this campaign through the Caribbean and into Florida wasn't exactly successful, that didn't stop McGregor from self-promoting and inflating the truth. He would concoct stories of his great military exploits that never happened, while leveraging his friendship with Bolivar to give himself credibility. However, tricking people in the Caribbean and the Americas could only get him so far. If he was going to become wealthy beyond his wildest dreams, he would need to return home to Europe where the real money was. But first he had to lay the groundwork for what would be the most elaborate con ever created. In 1820, McGregor convinced one of the regional indigenous kings to give him around 8 million acres of territory along the Mosquito Coast of Central America. There were a couple of problems with this piece of land. 
which should have been obvious from the name of the coast on which it lies. The first was that the land McGregor acquired was nothing but dense jungle that would take thousands of men years to clear and then build a town in it. The second problem was that the insects in the region carried a variety of deadly diseases that would ravage any population that dared to settle there. However, if McGregor could convince wealthy businessmen and colonists back in Europe that this land already had a vibrant settlement and cheap fertile land, he could sell parts of his 8 million acres of jungle to anyone who wanted to start a new life or make money in the Americas. Very few people in England had ever been to Central America before, therefore they'd have no idea what they were getting themselves into. The sale of the land would make McGregor incredibly rich, and he could live the lavish life he'd always wanted. The only problem was that he couldn't just sell random pieces of land in Central America to people in Europe because no one wanted to buy it unless they were guaranteed to make money or could build a life for themselves there. He needed a selling point, something that would make the mosquito-infested jungle desirable to the masses. If there was an established country with a bustling port that traded goods across the Americas already there, the land would be an easy sell. Since this country didn't exist, McGregor took it upon himself to make one up. He had already had no intention of actually starting his own country, building a settlement, or even developing the land at all. Instead, McGregor decided he would fabricate an elaborate lie, forge documents, and trick people into thinking that there was a little-known country in Central America that could make them rich. This was the birth of the made-up nation of Poyais. Gregor McGregor sailed to London with his fake documents in hand to convince colonists and businessmen to invest and settle in one of the most lucrative up-and-coming countries in the world. McGregor even had an etching created of what the trading town of St. Joseph in Poyais looked like, with its deep water harbor and beautiful landscape in the background. When he stepped off the ship in London, he immediately went to work, convincing rich aristocrats with power that he had the opportunity of a lifetime. He told them that he was there as an emissary for Poyais, and that not only did he have the authority to sell the land in the country, but he was actually the cacique, or prince of the nation. McGregor told stories of the riches that Poyais possessed and how profitable it would be due to its prominent location along the coast. This allowed for easy access to multiple trade routes and the ability to acquire goods from around the Americas. McGregor would gain audiences with wealthy investors and people who were looking to leave England and settle in the New World. He was adamant that no matter who you were, you could make a fine living for yourself in Poyais, for the right price, that is. McGregor went from business to business and house to house. He told stories of the lush, fertile paradise that was Poyais. Most people he talked to had never left England, let alone cross the Atlantic to see the New World. Therefore, he could invent stories to make his made-up country seem like a paradise, when in reality, anyone that had sailed the Caribbean waters knew that most of Central America was untamed jungle, and that there was no such thing as a vibrant country in the location that McGregor was describing. Most people at the time envisioned the Americas as a place full of potential. It was a world with endless farmland and streams filled with gold. Basically, many saw the Americas as a paradise, and McGregor had no intention of correcting this misconception, especially when it pertained to Poyais and the Mosquito Coast. Since McGregor was the prince of the country, he was in that unique position to offer settlers a premium on the land that they bought. He told them that the native Poyers were a kind, hard-working people that would be more than happy to help the settlers build their homes and farm their fields once they got there. When questioned about the name Mosquito Coast and how bad the bugs actually were, McGregor reassured investors that Poyais was especially lucky as its location gave it a temperate climate that kept almost all tropical diseases and insects away. Poyais seemed perfect in every way, almost too good to be true, mostly because it was. Nothing that Gregor McGregor said about Poyais was actually factual because the country didn't exist. Whenever someone began to question the authenticity of McGregor's claims, he would pull out his forged documents, etchings, and Poyais money that he had printed himself. Most of this was more than enough to put people's minds at ease. His Highness Gregor of Poyais quickly rose through the ranks of British society and found himself among some of the wealthiest aristocrats in the country. Once word got out of McGregor's amazing opportunity in Central America, people were falling over themselves to accommodate the prince. To make their stay in England more comfortable, a wealthy aristocrat even set up McGregor and his wife in a country estate, while the Lord Mayor held a banquet in their honor. All of these extravagances came from a lie. McGregor seemed to have thought of everything. He made up a country that satisfied the needs of both the wealthy and the lower classes, looking to move or expand operations into the Americas. He had documentation as evidence that everything he was saying about Poyais was true, and now he had very wealthy and powerful friends in England that could introduce him to even more prospective buyers. When his integrity was brought into question, Gregor McGregor would cite his past military achievements, always slightly over-exaggerating and reminding people of his connections to Simon Bolivar 
As the interest in buying land in Poyais grew, McGregor armed himself with more documentation to make sure no one would question this made-up country. He created a handwritten land grant from the Mosquito King himself, proving that he had the right to sell the land. McGregor also had a flag from Poyais, which was just a recycled flag he had used during his campaign through the Caribbean and Amelia Island. It might seem unbelievable that someone could fake the existence of an entire country and sell its land to people halfway across the world. But at the time, information coming from the Americas to Europe was slow. There was no way to look up if the country that McGregor was selling actually existed. The documents he had created were good enough, and since there was no way to send someone to check on his claims without launching a full expedition, people took his word for it. Once McGregor had drummed up enough interest in Poyais, he took things a step further. McGregor introduced a 200,000 pound Poyais bond in the London money market that was quickly bought up. The massive amount of money along with all the cash from the land sold to future settlers made Gregor McGregor a rich man. But the good times couldn't last forever, eventually enough funds were raised to launch a ship full of settlers and merchants to start their new lives in Poyais. This was always an inevitability, and Gregor knew what would actually be waiting for them in Central America. He had tried to stall the expedition for as long as possible, but the time had come. In September 1822, the Honduras packet set sail from London to Poyais with around 50 settlers aboard. Four months later, a ship from Leith, Scotland began its journey to the fake country with around 200 people aboard who had purchased land from Gregor McGregor. Most people aboard the ships had invested their entire life savings and everything they owned into the voyage and their future in Poyais. In fact, whatever money they did have left over, they converted to Poyais dollars, which McGregor was now printing in Scotland. They were not planning on coming back from Poyais once they were there. Why should they? McGregor had told them how perfect the country was and had provided them with documents that proved that they had bought land and could begin a new life there. Unfortunately for the settlers, they were sailing toward a country that didn't exist and a hostile land that would take many of their lives. The seas were rough, and many people became miserably seasick on their first journey aboard a large ship, but they believed it would all be worth it in the end. After several weeks of sailing, the Poyais settlers finally spotted their new homeland, but as they got closer, something seemed wrong. Their hearts sank as they approached the coast of Central America. The first thing they noticed about Poyais was that there was nothing there but jungle. There was no settlement, no harbor, no people. It was at this point they first realized that maybe, maybe Gregor McGregor had been lying about the whole thing. This must have been a horrifying thought, as everyone on board the ships had given up their lives back home to make this journey, and the unfortunate part was that things were about to get so much worse. There were two things that this new land seemed to have, a lot of jungle and then even more bugs. The settlers dropped anchor and rowed ashore to find that as soon as they approached the beach, they were being eaten alive by mosquitoes and other insects. When the settlers tried to seek refuge away from the shore, they found the dense jungle was just as infested as the beach was. There was no land to farm and nowhere to seek shelter. The settlers had to start from scratch and create their own town in the untamed jungles of Central America. They hastily began cutting down trees to make shacks and huts to protect them from the intense Caribbean sun and nightly torrential downpours while the ships they came on sailed off to resupply and conduct other business. The land was nothing like McGregor had made it out to be. It was not temperate, and the soil was not fertile. The settlers managed to build several huts that they crammed into while they waited for help to arrive. Unfortunately, every moment that the settlers spent in the land that was supposed to be Poyais, they were at risk of contracting malaria, yellow fever, and other deadly tropical diseases. They had very little of food and supplies. There was no way of knowing what jungle fruits and plants could be eaten and what was poisonous. As the days carried on, the disease began to set in. One of the survivors of the whole ordeal, named James Hasty, wrote in his journal, Sickness and despondency was so general that few were able or willing to make any exertion. The settlers lay dying in their makeshift huts. Anyone who was still able to move kept fires going on the beach as a beacon for ships to see. They hoped that anyone who saw the signals would stop and help them. In May of 1823, a rescue ship finally arrived. When the crew rode onto the beach, they were horrified at what they found. Emaciated settlers shambled out of the jungle like zombies. Their bodies were covered in bug bites, and their rib cages could be seen just under their skin. The crew was expecting to bring 250 settlers aboard and return them home to England, but only around 80 people survived. The rest had died from disease and starvation. Gregor McGregor's lie about his made-up country of Poyais had led over a hundred people to their deaths. The settlers who were still alive were brought aboard the ship, cared for, and brought back to England. As the tragedy of the Poyais settlers unfolded halfway across the world, Gregor McGregor continued to sell fictitious land in his country that did not exist. News traveled very slowly as the only form of communication was via word of mouth or letters carried by ships. For months, no one knew what had become of the Poyais settlers. 
But that was all about to change. When the ship carrying the survivors returned to England, Gregor McGregor knew he was in trouble. He was going to be questioned, and his lies were about to catch up with him. But surprisingly, things went very differently than expected. McGregor denied the accusations that Poyais didn't exist, and instead suggested maybe the crews and leaders of the ships were incompetent and brought the settlers to the wrong location. McGregor's supporters and powerful friends in England backed him up, and even suggested there were agents and collaborators who were trying to sabotage the growth of Poyais in the New World. The craziest part was that some of the settlers who had been through hell in Central America supported these claims. They truly believed that Poyais did exist in the form that McGregor had told them about, and that they were just dropped off at the wrong spot. Most of the blame for what had happened to the settlers that McGregor tricked was put onto the captains of the ships that led the voyages. McGregor had entrenched himself so deeply into the fabric of English society that it was inconceivable to many that he could possibly be lying. His powerful friends went after the press who tried to sully the Prince of Poyais' good name. But there was one person who knew the country of Poyais had been completely made up, and that was McGregor himself. Using the confusion and turmoil unfolding in England around Poyais as a distraction, McGregor fled. He knew it was only a matter of time before his lie would be uncovered. Using his newly accumulated wealth, Gregor McGregor booked passage to France in 1823. He hadn't been found guilty of any crimes in England, yet, and since it was rare that England and France shared information with one another, word of the Poyais fiasco in McGregor's con would likely never make it to Paris. It was here that Gregor McGregor decided to set up shop and pitch his fake country once again. McGregor used his fake documents, maps, and Poyais money to try and persuade French aristocrats and common folk to invest in the lands of his made-up country. While in Paris, McGregor created a Poyais constitution to further legitimize his phony country. He once again secured bank loans to begin recruiting settlers to sail for Poyais, settlers who hoped to make their fortunes in the New World. However, the French were not as quick to believe that Gregor McGregor was the prince of a country they never heard of. The French authorities launched an investigation into McGregor and uncovered some unsettling things. It's unclear what exact evidence was brought against McGregor, maybe one of the former Poyais settlers who had been stuck on the insect-infested coast of Central America on the first expedition followed him to Paris. Or perhaps the French did a little more digging than the English, and when no one could corroborate the existence of Poyais, they threw McGregor in jail. Regardless of how it happened, the French authorities did, in fact, end up arresting McGregor. He was brought to court and tried for fraud and conspiracy. However, due to lack of evidence, McGregor was acquitted of his crimes and released from prison eight months later. To be fair, the French did not know all the details of how much money McGregor had stolen in England or how many people died during the expeditions to the fake country of Poyais. If they had, McGregor likely would have been sentenced to death. The craziest part is that McGregor did not stop the con even after he was arrested, tried, and then released. Gregor McGregor continued to convince people to invest in land in Poyais for another decade. He even had the audacity to go back to London and begin recruiting settlers and investors from the upper class once again. In fact, in 1827, McGregor issued an 800,000 pound bond back into the money market, which he used to sell more fake Poyais land certificates. Gregor McGregor was a master of deception and an expert at conning people out of their money. It's insane that he got away with making up a fake country and continued to run the same con for years without being stopped. Poyais, a country that never existed, made Gregor McGregor an incredibly wealthy man. At the end of the 1830s, McGregor finally gave up the ruse. He left Europe for Venezuela, where he was awarded a full military pension for helping in the war for independence against Spain. Gregor McGregor lived there until 1845. He died peacefully in Venezuela, never having been convicted of a single crime even though he made up an entire country, stole people's money, and was the main reason for the death of over 100 people. Gregor McGregor might have been one of the best con men in all history. Now watch how a prisoner simply walked out of prison, or check out how I stole $850 million online.